Hi, I'm Jess Fields. Welcome to the show. The other day I interviewed Bishop David Condorla. Condorla is the Roman Catholic Bishop of the Diocese of Tulsa and Eastern Oklahoma, where he was appointed by Pope Francis in 2016. Prior to that, he spent over two decades in pastoral ministry, primarily with college students, as the priest of St. Mary's Catholic Center in College Station, Texas, which is where Texas A&M University is located. He's from Bryan, Texas, and is one of 12 siblings. And so we talked to him about how he became a priest and then how he became a bishop and what he has to say in the present coronavirus pandemic. Whatever your faith background, I think you'll agree this is an interesting interview with Bishop David Conderla. Joining me now is Bishop David Conderla of the Diocese of Tulsa in Eastern Oklahoma, Bishop, Your Excellency, it's so wonderful to have you on. Good to be with you. So uh, you are one of 12 <laughs> brothers and sisters from Bryan, Texas, and mm -hmm. uh, you had a very interesting uh, pathway just even to the priesthood, much less becoming bishop. Could you tell us a little bit about your early life and what initially uh, got you on the road to that vocation? Sure. I grew up in Bryan uh, in that big family going to St. Joseph's Catholic School. And so I had a very, uh, in that respect, a very typical Catholic upbringing. Um, I did not want to go to college when I got out of high school. You know, I went to Bryan High School, um, class of 1978, and I wanted to go to work. I didn't want to go to college. Even during high school, I did that program where you could work half a day and school half a day. So I went to work uh, for the USDA Vet Toxicology Lab for a few years, and then I transitioned into machine work, and I was working as a machinist um, in my early 20s. And in that period of my life, I had what I would describe as a much deeper uh, conversion to Jesus Christ as a disciple, coming to recognized Jesus as someone who loved me and someone who I loved and someone who I wanted to live for. That process, that, that conversion, that deeper uh, joining of the faith is what led me to reconsider a question that I had been asked when I was 20 years old by my pastor, John Driscoll. He had asked me if I ever thought about being a priest. And I said, of course I haven't thought about being a priest. I don't want to be a priest. Uh, <laughs> That was true at the age of 20, but at the age of 25, I wanted to be a priest. So I went into the seminary, uh, went through 10 years of seminary, was ordained at the age of 35, served as a priest in the Diocese of Austin. Uh, College Station, Bryan College Station is on the eastern edge of that diocese. Served for that diocese until 2016, and uh, then I was called to move to Tulsa and take on the role of bishop in Tulsa. Wonderful. Well, I want to ask you about those steps because uh, uh, is it true that you rode a motorcycle during some of this time? Talk a little bit about that. There's not a lot of motorcycle riding bishops around. I Actually, there are a couple who still ride, I think. Uh, and I know a couple of my priests still ride. Um, when I was, let's see, I was about eight maybe I was about 18 or 19 I bought a motorcycle uh, living there in Bryan what did and your mom and dad say uh, your excellency were they were they thrilled about that or <laughs> well now okay so that makes it clear of the timeline I was 20 at least because they were already gone they had already moved to Corpus Christi I see okay. uh, my mother did not like the motorcycle she didn't <laughs> at all and in fact I went to visit them about a month after I bought it, and in Corpus Christi had a wreck on the motorcycle. Oh my goodness gracious. And she was so hopeful that it was totaled, that it couldn't be fixed. But of course it wasn't, it wasn't totaled. So, so uh, I rode it for a couple of years, but then I got tired of it. Uh, it's not much fun riding a motorcycle in weather and wind and rain and cold and all that. Right. So, Bit of it. Yeah, Central and East Texas maybe not the most friendly environment for people to be riding around in motorcycles. No, the, the scariest moment with that motorcycle was the morning that I was riding to work, 
and a spider crawled across my face shield on the inside. <laughs> I couldn't stop quick enough to get that helmet off. It scared the light. <laughs> oh my goodness gracious. So um when whenever then you were you were working as a, a machinist and, and you were uh you know kind of uh, in that early part of your career maybe discerning kind of what you wanted to do with your life there had to be a moment just a particular maybe a i mean i don't know if there was any one moment but maybe a few moments that really stood out to you that said hey you know it's you need to go in this different direction was there anything that kind of shook you like that or uh in some ways it was gradual the the moment of conversion, the moment of, of making a personal commitment to serve the Lord, to live for the Lord, that happened sort of dramatically and quickly. Uh, but then it was about a two-year process of, of thinking about, well, what does this all mean then? Uh, still having a good relationship with my pastor and a good friendship with him and enjoying uh, working in various ministries and youth ministries and things around the church, those things allowed me to experience the, the distinguishing between serving people as a machinist and meeting their, quote, mechanical needs uh, versus working with people in their spiritual life and in their spiritual needs. And over those couple of years, I came to see that I really felt a deeper sense of meaning, a deeper sense of call in the realm of the spiritual life. And so that opened me back up to the possibility of seminary. I went to visit the seminary in Houston, where you now live, uh, St. Mary's Seminary, on a weekend retreat that's designed for people who are considering the vocation, and just fell in love with the place uh, on that retreat weekend. and. That really cemented for me that this this really felt right. So uh, I uh, sold my part of the business back to my partner and left out of there and, and went to seminary and enjoyed it very much. So obviously for those who are not maybe Catholic who are watching this, the Catholic Church is very sacramental and views a lot of different parts of life uh, in the church as sacramental. So were there any particular devotions or uh, practices that really drew you in during that time when you were discerning that vocation that meant a lot to you? Well, the, the Eucharist is the center of our faith, uh, the celebration of Mass. I had, of course, all my life up to the age of 25, celebrated Mass, gone to Mass, uh, served at Mass, that all took on a whole new light with this deeper sense of call and this deeper sense of vocation. Uh, I became much more attentive to what the priest was doing and trying to envision what, what is that like? What would that be like to live that way, to serve people in that capacity? Uh, those things became much more meaningful. So then you decided to become a priest. And obviously that's a pretty big commitment. What does that entail? I mean, I'm sure a lot of people have wondered, uh, you know, that becoming a priest, um, some in the world would probably say that, that you're giving up your whole life. You can't get married. You, you, you have to not own all kinds of, you know, cool things maybe. I mean, what, what is it that, uh, that actually is required to become a priest, uh, a bishop baby? Well, um, a lot of the things that, that are required in terms of commitment and in terms of vocation are very similar to marriage. And so people often don't think that. They think that celibate life is the opposite of marriage, but celibate life is the parallel, really, of marriage. Uh, a married person loves in a narrow way, loves, focuses their love on their spouse and their family. The celibate focuses their love broadly, uh, but both are called to love people, uh, to be in love with people. And so uh, learning that helps clear the way for most people as they begin seminary formation. I just accepted two young uh, men as seminarians today for this diocese. Uh, as they enter seminary, those are some of the things that they'll learn in those first years. 
uh, seminary, the seminary process is uh, academically, it's a bachelor's degree in philosophy and a master's degree in theology. Sometimes there's further studies after that, but that's the general thing. Uh, the bachelor's degree is a four-year degree, like any bachelor's degree. The master's degree, though, is also a four-year degree. And usually oh, wow. there's... Yeah, it's a, it's a longer master's degree. Uh, and usually there's another year added of a pastoral internship where the young man is working in a parish, experiencing life in a parish in the middle of that four-year uh, master's degree. Uh, in the fourth year then of the master's degree, he would normally be ordained as a deacon, a transitional deacon. He would serve for a number of months as a deacon, and then he would be ordained as a priest uh, after that fifth year was up. So seven years if he already has a bachelor's degree of education and formation, uh, nine years if he starts as a first year college freshman. Your Excellency, I've, I've read accounts of priests um, uh, who have gone through this process and um, uh, uh, people that maybe even later became saints uh, in the Catholic Church. And um, there's often doubt that creeps in. Obviously, uh, you know, uh, uh, the devil doesn't want to make more priests, right? So, I, I mean, surely during seminary, there had to be some moments of doubt. Did you have any particularly profound experiences with that that, that you'd like to share? Well, I would say this, that um, about 55% of the men that we send to seminary are, are ultimately ordained as priests. That often surprises people to know that. Uh, the Not reason, a great ratio. Right. The reason is because it is a real discernment. So a young man who feels a calling to the priesthood is a young man. And so he's still learning who he is in the world. Uh, we send him to seminary so that he can be educated, but so that he can deepen his discernment and come to a much clearer understanding. Is this something that Jesus is calling him to, or is it coming from somewhere else? Is the, hmm. the belief that he wants to be a priest or the desire to be a priest, is it coming from somewhere else? So for about 40 or 45 percent of the young men that go, they discern that it's coming from somewhere else. And uh, they typically leave the seminary and become excellent husbands and fathers, uh, raise families. They serve as fathers in a different way. Um, but doubt, so, so in that sense, doubt is built in. The seminary is a challenging environment. The, the faculty want to challenge the young man to know himself really deeply and to understand at a very deep level, is this something he's really called to? So in that sense, doubt is built in. There can also be deeper doubts uh, that are vocational doubts. In my own case, uh, I took my, would have been my eighth year. I took a leave of absence for a year because I reached the point where I wasn't sure. Uh, while I was in seminary, I, I began to look serious. So there's a difference between the life of diocesan priests who serve in parishes and the life of monks who live in monasteries. And so I became enamored of Trappist monasticism, which is one branch, one religious uh, order of the church, and was very seriously considering and discerning a vocation to Trappist monastic life. Ultimately, that led me back to the diocese, but by the time I got back to the diocese, I felt a great sense of confusion between those two vocations because they're actually quite different. So that caused me to say, you know what, I'm awfully close to diaconate ordination at this point. I'm gonna take some time out and try to think this through a bit more. So, so I took a leave. So Your Excellency, this was just to just to remind someone watching or listening. You were eight years into what you said was a ten-year. I mean, so you were almost at the end 
and you right. were having this experience. I'm sorry, continue. Right. Yeah, exactly. Which is kind of funny because uh, in my first year of seminary, one of the guys that was in the eighth year left. And he was someone who I really looked up to and admired. And I remember thinking at the time, how stupid do you have to be to go through eight years and then leave? And then I found myself eight years later <laughs> taking a leave of absence. So anyway, I took this leave of absence. Uh, during that time, I did a what's called a clinical pastoral education residency year, a chaplaincy intern year, you could say, at a hospital. That was very helpful. Uh, quickly, I got my head screwed back on straight. And uh, after that year was up, went back to the seminary and was ordained and everything continued on from there. Wow. But it's not a smooth road, it doesn't sound like, for anybody that is maybe discerning, anybody that's watching this that's discerning a, a, a vocation, it, that maybe you should expect a few bumps along the way. Yeah, I would say it's important for someone to understand that bumps are normal because if they don't understand that, when they experience them, they may feel like, oh my gosh, something wrong is happening. Mm. And then they may not be patient enough to settle down, walk with God, come to a deeper understanding, and then move, move on. So you ended up, I think, um, uh, you said you, you were in Austin for a period of time, mm -hmm. and then uh, uh, where uh, you spent a, a great deal of time uh, then was as priest of St. Mary's Catholic Church in College Station, Texas, uh, which uh, uh, for those who don't know is uh, uh, Texas A&M University. Uh, everyone knows that's the finest university in the world, uh, but uh, it happens to have one of the largest Catholic student bodies uh, in America. People would be surprised maybe to learn that. And you really fostered that program. Talk a little bit about how you were able to galvanize so much student involvement in, forgive me, what is to most modern uh, folks, I think, uh, a very crusty appearance of this ancient, you know, the Catholic Church and, uh, you know, kind of stayed. And, but yet students at A&M, there's a huge student body interested in the church and, and St. Mary's makes hundreds of new Catholics every year. So, so how did you get into doing all of that? One of my uh, good friends, Bill Kruger, a, a great attorney in Dallas, said that I was the pastor of the Aggie Catholic Nation. That's, that's the way he described it. Um, I came to St. Mary's in 1997 as an associate pastor. And the pastor at the time was my first communion classmate, uh, Mike Sis. Mike and I grew up in Bryan together. In fact, our mothers worked at St. Joseph Hospital for a while together. Um, we were together for almost four years, and then I left there and went back to the, to the city of Austin to work as the vocation director, working with the seminary students. Uh, I was doing that for four and a half years, and then I came back and Mike and I switched places. I became the pastor at St. Mary's. He became the vocation director for the diocese. And then I was there for 11 years. So uh, about 15 of my 22 years of priesthood uh, were served at Texas A&M. So it was a tremendous gift to me. Uh, Mike and uh, the priest before him set St. Mary's on a very solid foundation. One of the gifts that St. Mary's has is precisely the university itself. It's such a wonderful uh, and wholesome environment uh, in, in uh, College Station. And um, the campus ministry, I think the, the, the main thing that causes a campus ministry to really be able to, to go forward and flourish is the decision for how you're going to fund it. How are you going to fund the programs? Because, uh, you know, people are shy to talk about money and ministry together, but you can't do the one without the other. Uh, it's hard to hire the people that you need. You can't have campus ministry staff. Uh, you can't have the infrastructure. You can't build the buildings that you need. If you don't have people who see the importance of the mission of the thing, and are able to and willing to jump in and say, this is something I really want to drive forward. 
And we were very fortunate at A&M that the Aggies are very loyal to their school and in the case of Catholic Aggies, to their parish. And so we had plenty of people who recognized that that campus ministry was a very valuable thing to the church worldwide and who wanted to support it. So we built a very vibrant ministry. The students themselves are the key to the whole thing because their faith, and you, you know this from the campus generally, not, not just Texas A&M and many campuses these days, but Texas A&M is a campus that's very friendly to faith. That's not true in every college these days, but it's certainly true at Texas A&M. Very friendly to faith. Catholics are about 25 or 26% of the population of the students. So there's about 17 or 18,000 Catholics between A&M and Blinn College. Uh, so we had a lot to work with. And so, so that would be a critical mass, you know, like a nuclear reactor. Once you reach a, sort of a critical mass, it starts to live on its own. So that was what was going on there. So when you have people coming in and um, in a campus environment like that in Texas, obviously you have a lot of people that are Protestants that are coming in and, and maybe wanting to learn more uh, about uh, what is Catholicism or what else is out there. Um, what do you do in that kind of situation to explain uh, the Catholic faith to people that are just coming in and, and maybe there's something else, maybe they're a totally different faith, but they're curious about learning more about Catholicism. Yeah, there's a process within the church called the Rite of Christian Initiation of Adults. Uh, it goes by the acronym RCIA. And the RCIA process begins with an inquiry period, which is simply designed to let someone who's curious uh, come and ask questions and, and learn a little more about what the church is and what the church believes. If after the inquiry uh, process, they still find themselves to be interested and in wanting to pursue more, wanting to, to move in the direction of full communion with the church, then they enter what is sort of an educational and formational uh, process. Usually it lasts about a year. It can go longer if they want. Uh, and then they typically are brought into the church uh, at the Easter vigil celebration. Now, this is that very odd year that we hope we can never repeat uh, where we couldn't have mass at the Easter vigil. That was the most amazing thing in the world to us, to not be able to celebrate public mass together uh, at Easter. And uh, so that there are many people around the world who have been journeying through the RCIA who are still waiting to receive those Easter sacraments. And we're looking forward quickly to the day when we can uh, celebrate them. You certainly have a, a, a sense of sadness in your voice as you say that. Hey, what does that mean to you personally? This is unprecedented. Well, it's very hard, uh, particularly for the faithful. For Catholics, we believe that the the bread and wine at the mass change and actually become the body and blood of Jesus Christ given to us for our salvation. So to not be able to receive Holy Communion is a huge uh, deal, a huge sacrifice. And it's hard for them to understand why. Why does this have to happen? I can go to Lowe's, the place is packed. I go to Walmart to shop, the place is packed but I can't go to church and receive communion. So it's very hard to understand and explain uh, that this has to happen in order to try to save lives because people are dying of this pandemic. So that's just very hard. It's also hard on the priests. You know, it's one thing to, and the bishops, it's one thing to uh, live stream a mass. Yes, we can do it, but it's very odd to do it. It, it leaves you feeling uh, sort of empty in a way. It's, 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 there's a strangeness to it. Um, the Eucharist is still the Eucharist, but gosh, not having the people there, looking at a camera or a telephone, you know, is not the same thing at all. So to what extent does uh, any person in, 
in pastoral authority uh, in the Catholic Church, whether a, a priest or, uh, in your case, a, a bishop, uh, to what extent do you kind of shoulder those burdens of the faithful yourself? I mean, as people go through these difficult times, do you feel it really weighing on you that much more? And, and do you kind of um, suffer along with them? Or could you describe how you kind of internalize that? Yes, I was on a, a Zoom call. We've all learned what Zoom is these days. Never heard of it before three weeks ago. Um, I was on a Zoom call this afternoon with about 70 bishops who make up what are called the mission dioceses uh, of the Catholic Extension Organization. And uh, one of the things that we did in our conversation was just to talk a little bit about with an, one another, how are you guys doing? How are you being affected by this? And we're all being affected the same way as our priests are. When you receive emails and letters from people who are upset, who are hurting, frustrated, uh, you can't look at those and not be moved by them. Uh, and there's no way to give a convincing answer for why this is all happening. Uh, it is happening. <laughs> it is a reality. Um, in Oklahoma, the governor has expressed a plan for beginning to reopen the state. It has several phases. One of the phases, the early phase, talks about churches being reopened. But the churches have to reopen in a way that they can still keep people safe. We can't go back immediately to a circumstance where you have a church that can hold 700 and 800 people are packed into it for Sunday mass. We can't do that. So <clears throat> it's gonna require a bit more time and patience and a number of phases. As we say, okay, in this phase, we can have this many people together at a time. So that means mass is gonna look like this. In the next phase, we can have more. And so we're figuring it all out as we go along. So there's, a, as I understand it, a, a concept um, in Catholicism of redemptive suffering. And um, what, could you speak a little bit about that, maybe as it relates to the current pandemic crisis? Oh, well, sure. And I see it all the time. Uh, when I, I celebrate Mass each day from my chapel here in my house, and it's live streamed. Facebook Live, another thing I never heard of. Um, now I'm an expert. <clears throat> Actually, not an expert. I don't know much of it, but I know how to turn it on. Um, so Facebook Live, and you know, people can put comments on it. And so people who are watching put up comments. And I read in those comments this very uh, sentiment from the people. They're, they, you know, the, the majority of people understand why this is necessary and are right there with us and with the church in saying, you know, we've got to do this to save lives. But it's hard to do. Uh, now it's been five weeks in this diocese uh, that no one's received communion. I talked to uh, one of our priests today who's retired. He just celebrated his 50th anniversary on April the 2nd in the, uh, the uh, senior care center where he lives by himself because no one's allowed in. They're not even allowed to go room to room and visit one another. So, you know, that's really hard. Uh, but he understands, he, he knows why it is the way it is. So we're gonna do what we can when it's all over to, to make that a special event for him. But uh, yeah, redemptive suffering is when I, find that in God's providence, I have to endure something that's hard for me to endure, but I do so willingly, uniting myself to the sufferings of Jesus Christ for the sake of his body, the church. Uh, that's redemptive suffering. I don't just go through it kicking and cursing, although I might kick and curse some, uh, but I go through it almost in a sense willingly, willingly to endure it. It's what the martyrs did as they went to their deaths with smiles on their faces and psalms in their mouths, uh, knowing that they would be redeemed. 
So yeah, I think um, as we kind of heard your personal journey earlier, one of the things that, uh, that is probably on someone's mind is, well, okay, how do you become a bishop? I mean, uh, you, were, you were a priest for many years uh, at this uh, parish, which was, uh, uh, you know, really humming along quite well and, and yes, growing very rapidly. And then like, what do you just suddenly get a call and it's like, hey, you're a bishop now. I mean, <laughs> how does that process work? Well, as I joked with you before we started, you become a bishop the same way you get hit by a bus. You're <laughs> in the wrong place at the wrong time. <laughs> Yeah, you have to be. I think in the early church, uh, people were dragged uh, to become bishops, right? So there wasn't exactly some zeal uh, by, uh, by the saints to become bishops, it doesn't seem like. Well, the, the man who was pastor there before me became a bishop also. So that was a very unusual circumstance for the church anywhere in the world, let alone in the United States, where two men, both of whom were campus ministry pastors of the same place, one after the other to be named as bishops. So the, the process that the church has and uses uh, is a spirit-guided process that involves also some machinery, a, a bureaucratic kind of machinery that begins with the bishops themselves. So bishops of every diocese, uh, gathering together as provinces. So that's another larger administrative distinction. Uh, when, when provinces meet, once every few years, the bishops in that province talk among themselves about priests within the province who strike them as persons who have the capacity and the qualities to make a good bishop. Uh, if they have priests in, in that uh, province, they send those names up the line, so to speak, to the Congregation for Bishops in Rome. The Congregation for Bishops is an administrative arm of the Vatican. Chief things that they do is um, to take those names and then to conduct a very thorough vetting uh, process that's all highly secret. The person happening. Uh, they seek out people that know this person, who have been in ministry with the person, who have worked with the person. They ask uh, a set of questions together in a sense a file for this person. And then if a diocese comes open that it seems like this person would be a good fit for, they put together of persons who would make a good bishop for that place and they give that to the Holy Father and recommend a name to him. He can take the name that's recommended or he can take one of the other names or he can send all three of the names back and say I want another list. So Your Excellency, uh, forgive me for interrupting, but there was a little bit of a breakup in the connection. So just kind of to recap, you're saying that there's this uh, commission in, in Rome uh, they, they kind of go through and do this thorough vetting, and they actually will go back into your past and mm -hmm. talk to people that knew you. So mm -hmm. if I can just put a pause on that and ask, I mean, who in your life got a call saying, hey, is this, is this fellow uh, bishop material? Did, or what did they ask, and who did they talk to? It's both secret in terms of telling the person when it's happening, but it's also secret in terms of telling the person that it happened. So, so in other words, really? the, people, the people that were asked are also not supposed to tell me that they were asked. Are you saying that they might not even know that they were asked? It was kind of a conversation that they, they weren't even aware this was it, what it was about? Or? No, no, they would know. Okay. I have, I have been involved in this process for some others, and I won't tell those others that I was one of the people that was involved in the process. Even after they become a bishop, you, you don't... Right. Wow. Okay. The, so, so once the Holy Father decides, then he calls the, the uh, papal nuncio. The papal nuncio is the head diplomat, basically, for the Vatican in a country. In the United States, currently, the uh, papal nuncio is Christophe Pierre, Archbishop Christophe Pierre. 
So he calls the papal nuncio. The papal nuncio then calls the person and says, and basically it's a short conversation. Uh, he says, uh, Father, the Holy Father has uh, appointed you as a bishop of XYZ. Do you accept? And you say you do or you don't. So I... Um... <laughs> So this is a pretty impactful conversation, Your Excellency. I'm sure you're just, you're, so where were you sitting? What were you doing when, when you get this phone call? You must remember that. Yes, I think every bishop remembers. Uh, in my case, I was sitting in my office at St. Mary's uh, in the midst of a normal work day doing email, which is a modern curse for everyone. And, um, the call came from the receptionist. There's someone on the phone. I picked it up, still doing email, cradling the phone in my shoulder. <laughs> and there's this foreign accent on the phone who I took to be a missionary priest who was coming to preach at our place that summer. So I was listening, but at a certain point, he said he was the nuncio. So then then I quit doing the email and I paid attention to the call. <laughs> there's, there's only a couple of reasons why a nuncio might call. Neither of them is terribly good, but uh, <laughs> a little bit of Bishop humor, I guess. Uh, there's only a couple of reasons. And so I listened to the call and that's basically what he said. Uh, the Holy Father has appointed you as the Bishop of Tulsa. Do you accept? They hope that you will say yes right then and there. I know of one uh, bishop who told me that he said to the nuncio, could I pray about this? And the nuncio said, the Holy Father has already prayed about it. Do you accept? <laughs> <laughs> oh, goodness. Oh, goodness gracious. So, I mean, it really is... Um, it's a it's a huge life changing thing. Obviously, you are obedient to the church, but it meant a lot of changes for you. Could you and and I, I hear a little bit of audio scruffling, like almost like paper shuffling uh, um, uh, on there. I don't know if you're you're hearing that, but you, you hear it now. I don't hear it now. No. Uh, so I, I'm curious if if you could describe the what that meant for you on a personal level, because you were obviously a priest near your family there uh, in Bryan College Station. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and so I'm sure there were some advantages to that, but also the role of obedience within, uh, within the Catholic Church, because obviously that is something that you chose as basically a, as obedience. So could you explain a little bit about that? Uh, it's similar. <clears throat> Every priest who's a diocesan priest moves generally on average about every six or 10 years. Uh, there are occasions here and there where it's longer, but generally it's about a dozen years at a place. So priests are used to the, the lifestyle of being in a place for a time and then moving maybe across the diocese. You know, the Diocese of Austin goes from College Station all the way over to Lano. So you could be serving in a big place, next in a rural place, next in a mid-sized place. So that part of it is similar for a person who becomes a bishop. You have to move, and we're somewhat used to moving. But in this case, you're moving to a different diocese. You're leaving behind the fraternity of priests that you have been ministering with for, in my case, 22 years, and joining a new fraternity of priests who now are going to become your uh, priests, so to speak, your sons in a way. Um, so it's, it's a big change. I would describe the, the concept of obedience, again, I would use... Uh, something that I think people would understand and identify with, it's similar to obedience in a marriage. Uh, obedience doesn't mean you do what I say, it's my way or the highway, it's that kind of thing. 
Uh, in the ancient past, perhaps it was more that way. But obedience means mature people who are both committed to a specific uh, cause or entity, in this case, the gospel of Jesus Christ and advancing that gospel in and through the Catholic Church, uh, and who understand that in order for that mission to, to happen, they need to be flexible because one person has a task in the hierarchy to oversee the rest and that requires some movement. And so occasionally, generally it's every year, uh, some, some part of the priests of a given place are gonna be asked to move to a different place. If someone retires, if someone dies, if someone leaves the diocese because they were made a bishop or because they're going into military service or whatever, for various reasons, parishes need a pastor or a new pastor. And so then that requires some moving around. So everything in the modern context, uh, Your Excellency, is a total disruption um, for people of faith. And there's obviously a lot of challenges for the average layperson, as well as for priests and bishops and uh, the whole uh, institution of not just the Catholic Church, but all Christian churches. Uh, where do you see this going? Do you think these challenges have a, a, a positive end, or is there going to be quite a lot of struggle in the years ahead as we recover from this particular crisis? I think that we should keep in mind that we're in the Easter season that even though this is going on and in a sense uh, it feels like Lent has continued, nonetheless we're in the Easter season, a time of celebration, a time when we recognize that Jesus has risen as a Savior. And we're in the Easter season, which means we're heading towards Pentecost, where we'll celebrate the coming of the Holy Spirit who dwells among us. So, for us as Christians, it's important for us to keep these things in context. There are many things that are disruptive about what's going on. We have to adapt to them, but we can adapt. So we're blessed in the sense, I mean, imagine doing what we're doing in 1916 when they had to do it the last time. We're blessed because we have the social media, that allows us, for example, to live stream uh, worship services. Now, of course, social media, if you spend all day scrolling through the feed, can be a great distraction, but it can also be a tremendous tool. I have the whole Bible on my phone. Well, that's a pretty convenient way to carry the scriptures around, right? So we keep these things in context. We remember that God is near us. God is in our midst. I think if we look for ways to be of service to others through this time that we're in, that that will both lift our spirits, but also give us direction. Because certainly there are people who are hurting, as I mentioned, the, the priest that I called this afternoon, uh, another priest in that same uh, facility is going to turn 90 in July. I hope we're done by then, otherwise he'll be having to celebrate his 90th birthday on his own, but I can make sure that he doesn't celebrate it on his own, even if we're not open by then, by giving him a phone call. So mm -hmm. things like that. It's important for us to recognize we have to take care of ourselves, but not to get overly focused in on our own issues, but to pay attention to what's going on around us. Your Excellency, do you think that this will have a negative impact on church attendance or piety among the faithful going forward? I'm hopeful that it actually will have a positive impact. I'll give you an example. Uh, according to the, whatever the statistics are on Facebook Live or whatever the feed is and all that, at the Easter vigil at the cathedral in Tulsa, there were something like 1,017 people following it. Well, that church only seats 700, and we never had even 500 at the Easter Vigil. So are there people who are tuning in to these things now 
who don't normally even come to mass, but who are, maybe they're just passively wanting to check on it because they're curious, but maybe that curiosity will lead to something deeper. Maybe they've been away for a while and now being able to uh, attend these things passively gives them the impetus to come back. So I think there's lots of hope that it will increase. Interesting. So kind of to that, um, if someone wanted to learn more about the Catholic faith and certainly uh, having uh, been at St. Mary's in College Station and having so many students uh, inquire and so forth, um, beyond or, or, or maybe long before somebody would be in RCIA or, or consider themselves an inquirer or be considered as such, how would you encourage someone to learn more about the faith? What steps would you have them take or reading or, or what have you? You know, one thing people could do if they know someone who's Catholic is simply uh, talk to them and talk to them about the possibility of attending worship service with them or uh, reading the catechism together or something like that. Of course, there's no end to the online resources. Uh, a really excellent one because they're, they're simply very savvy about both the faith, the history of the faith, and the use of technology to transmit it is uh, Bishop Robert Barron on the internet and what's called the Word on Fire Ministry. Uh, he has just a lot of videos there. One of them is the whole series on Catholicism. So it gives a person a kind of a encapsulated way to get an overview of what Catholicism is in a very excellently done and interesting way. Okay, Bishop Robert Barron, Word on Fire, any other uh, resources you would recommend? Well, I would say that they can simply search around. There's, a, there's an online resource called Catholic Answers that people find very popular. They also have a radio program because often people have simply questions. They, what they really want is just to shoot out a question. What about, what about this? What does this mean? What does that mean? And that's what Catholic Answers does. So you can go on their website. You can see threads there of questions that are already posed, but you can also pose your own. So that's another easy way. Well, uh, Your Excellency, as we wind down our time, I would ask for you to uh, maybe give some, some words of encouragement or uh, what have you to, not only just Catholics, but all Christians and even all people of faith. Uh, what would you say to them in this time of crisis? One thing that we're learning out of all of this, again, relearning, I suppose you could say, is our connection to one another uh, as human persons. So whatever your faith background, COVID is a leveling influence in a sense. It doesn't care uh, who you are. It seems to affect the older more, but it can affect anybody. We have even infants dying from it. Uh, and our common uh, united purpose to engage this social distancing and all of that that we're doing because we want to save lives. We want to actually lower the number of people that otherwise would die from this pandemic. That's something that I think if we would engage it prayerfully or at least reflectively, can help us to recognize we're really closer to one another than perhaps our politics and our Twitter feeds and all of those things would seem to indicate. Wonderful words. Um, Your Excellency, thank you for, for being here. Uh, we really appreciate you coming on. Enjoyed being with you. Take care. Bishop David Condorla of the Diocese of Tulsa in Eastern Oklahoma, thank you very much. And that was Bishop David Condorla. Remember, if you like the show, please subscribe on YouTube or in your favorite podcast app. If you have a suggestion for a guest or if you'd like to be one, email me at jessfieldshow at gmail.com. Thanks for listening.